Hello there, my small but faithful band of followers to this channel. My name is Martin Fillery, aka Straightjacket Spaceman, the guy who sings the theme to the Y Files, aka the guy who went to prison for turning a top secret underground Ministry of Defence nuclear bunker into the UK's biggest cannabis factory. Yeah. <laughs> well, I started writing a novel back in May 2014 when I was first living in that nuclear bunker. I'd never even thought of writing a novel before. I'd always been a professional singer-songwriter, so a page full of quirky lyrics had kind of been the limit of my literary skills prior to that. The fact it was a comedy at least kept me going, and I was writing it to not only be a book, but also a script for a 12 one-hour episode TV series that I'd written for myself to co-star in. It's about an unemployed eBayer who inadvertently brings John Lennon back to life by taunting God, and is in turn left to help the former Beatle prove to the world he's the real thing and get his old life back. I actually used my own name for the eBayer because I'd written the part to be played by me, and the original idea came from a dream I had in the nuclear bunker, and I was the guy who brought John Lennon back to life in my dream. As my top secret underground cannabis factory grew and grew, if you'll pardon the pun, I found myself getting ever more distracted from the book writing that had given me so much joy and fulfilment. By the time I was arrested on the 22nd of February 2017 and immediately sent to prison without bail, 12 million pounds worth of naughty plants had been grown in that bunker, but I was still only seven episodes into my script writing. I finished writing it in prison, not only as something to do, but as an act of defiance. I just thought, they can imprison my body, but my mind is still free. I felt a huge triumph in at last finishing writing my first book. It only took me three and a half years and losing everything in my life, including my girlfriend, my home, my 43 cars, my arcade machines, my film props, my vintage toy collection. You get the idea. Oh, and of course, three years, eight months actually in prison which was nice. Perhaps the most remarkable thing, though, is that I actually finished writing it on the 8th of December 2017, the actual anniversary of John Lennon's death back in 1980. I didn't even realise this until I phoned my friend and said, you're not going to believe it. I know it's been over three and a half years. I've actually finished writing the John Lennon book. And he said, do you realise what today's date is? I'm in prison, mate. Not seen too many calendars recently. Unless you count that 2003 Peter Andre one in Big Dave's cell, but we don't tend to go in there too much. It almost seemed like divine intervention or some kind of miracle that I'd actually finished it on that particular date. Either way, it seems only fitting that on this momentous occasion of the release of the last ever Beatles song, Now and Then, that I let you guys hear this first episode, which I recorded just onto my iPhone for me to listen back to for timing. Being a script, I wanted to be able to listen back at the end of each day of writing. I will soon be recording the proper audiobook to the same professional standard as my foot dance episodes. I hope you've been listening to them. But until then, please allow for this not being recorded to the same standard. This was, after all, recorded in a top-secret underground ex-Ministry of Defence nuclear bunker cannabis factory. Oh, and yes, of course, I've also written a book about that as well. But that's a whole other story. Either way, I will now leave you in the relatively capable hands of the former criminal Martin Fillery, circa early May 2014. If you're thinking at any point, this doesn't sound anywhere near as professional as his foot dance thing, yet do bear in mind I had about 300 cannabis plants growing at that exact time. I don't have that anymore. Thank God. That said, I could do with the money that 300 cannabis plants brings in, and I could certainly do with the money that 4,800 cannabis plants brings in. Trust me, over three years, it's about 12 million. Either way, enough of my yakking. Um, I'll forward it through some of the description that I've put there, um, because you'll kind of get it by just listening to it. I don't need to give you the story beforehand. Um, Right, here goes. Martin is our wise cracking protagonist and everyday unemployed guy who buys and sells on eBay to make ends meet. We follow his story while the world gets turned on its head as John Lennon comes back from the dead and is left in the care of Martin by God himself. Episode 1. In this episode we see how John Lennon comes back and that he's suffering from shock as the last thing he remembers was being shot five times in the back what feels like only hours ago. Martin is his sole carer and confident, and has to make decisions on his behalf in the beginning. 
As the episode progresses and John becomes more aware of where and more to the point when he is, he starts to connect with Martin, asking endless questions initially about Yoko, his sons and friends, but then about his death and finally just how much he has missed this past 35 years. The internet, Wikipedia and YouTube become a major influence in his life. We open on a news report on John Lennon's killer, Mark Chapman, and his impending release from prison. Martin and his friend are sat in the pub in light discussion after the news has just been on TV in the background. Imagine how much different the world might have been, though. The Beatles could have reformed, he might have gone into politics and made some real changes for the better, or even become a religious leader. Let's not forget what an influential man John Lennon was. Just imagine if you could only go back in time and prevent his assassination. Yeah, but imagine the butterfly effect, as so much of what you know could be different once you jump back to 2015. I think you mean the back to the future effect. Okay, well, let's just bring him back to right now. Shake things up a bit. No adverse effect on history. Just writing a wrong, maybe even writing a song. Well, you see, as a Catholic, I'm a little bit conflicted at the idea of bringing some random musician back from the dead. That's a privilege reserved only for our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Looks like the Pope's got a B in her knickers. Wow. I don't know where to begin on correcting you on that lackluster put down. From a trivial standpoint, it's a bee in her bonnet. From a religious standpoint, the Pope is a man, as am I. And from a dickhead standpoint, you're a twat. Ooh, sorry, Mother Teresa. It's Teresa. Yeah, sorry, Teresa. And anyway, I'm not enamored by the fact your John Lennon famously said that the Beatles were bigger than Jesus. Now, come on, you know that was taken out of context. Besides, your God always seems to take the good ones young, like John Lennon at only 40, and he still had so much more to give. Yet, what we get left with is the likes of Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, and Gaddafi. You know every one of those is dead, don't you? I mean, you probably haven't read a newspaper in your life, but I'd have thought something would have been mentioned on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube, where you seem to permanently reside. Okay, calm down, Trevor MacDonald. Sorry for not picking the latest and greatest tyrants of the hour. My sentiment was still solid. Why does your God take away those that give so much, and yet he leaves us with the likes of Fagash Lil over there, a woman who's 80 years old if she's a day, been a draw on the benefit system ever since there was a benefit system, with her litter of dysfunctional offspring and their extended litters breeding like rabbits, and all either in and out of prison on rotation, or carrying on great-grandma's legacy of dull bludging and sickness benefit scams. Christ knows how many millions her life has cost the taxpayer, and she's still living it. So it's okay to blaspheme now, is it? Hold on a minute, I'm not the Catholic, he's your God. God loves you as well, you know, whether you believe in him or not. I'm not even getting into that. I just think if God really exists, it would be nice if he did something really cool like... Realise he's overstocked on young musicians, what with Amy Winehouse, Kurt Cobain, Jimi Hendrix. I hope this list is merely reverse chronological order, not in order of preference. Oh, God, no. Hey, you know they were all 27. Ah, yes, the infamous 27 Club. Also starring Jim Morrison, Brian Jones, Janis Joplin, etc., etc. Well, anyway, imagine how friggin' cool it would be if, as a token offering... God suddenly handed back John Lennon. It really is like talking to a child trying to converse with you. That night, while in deep sleep, Martin is visited by God. All he sees at first is a blinding white light. His eyes strain, and he has to put his hand in front of his face to stop the glare of such an immense glow. From out of the light, he hears a bellowing voice. I notice you use my name a lot in everyday conversation, yet you don't even believe in me. Uh, yeah. I also can't even see you, and as I don't recognize your voice, I think you might have the wrong person. Oh, no. I have the right person. Look, mate, are you going to shine that in my face the whole time? Because this is just unpleasant. 
I've done things this way for eons now. Well, that's nice. Anyway, who are you then? Because you sound like Morgan Freeman. And this is my dream. Although, frankly, it's looking like it's going to be a bit of a non-starter now you're here. Hey, have you ever had a dream where you had to force yourself to wake up because it was just so boring? Like you're walking down a street and it's a really long street. And then you get to the end and there's nothing actually there. And now you're walking back this way on the street and it's even longer. And there's still nothing there. And you know there's nothing there because there was nothing there. But shut up. Right. You're obviously not here for a nice friendly chat then, so if you think you're going to throw your weight around in my dream, you've got another thing coming. Interesting threat? I've never had one before. So what do I have coming then? Hmm, good point. I've no idea actually, it's just an expression to be honest. Can I get back to you on that? I really don't have time for this. Do you know how busy I am? Well, I still don't even know who you are. With that, God steps forward out of the light. Oh, yes, you do, Martin. Oh, my God, you are Morgan Freeman. Oh, <laughs> well, technically, no, but I have chosen to look this way because that's how you remember me. Uh, I don't think so. Anyway, you're obviously not Morgan Freeman from Shawshank Redemption because he didn't have the beard, and you can't be him from Driving Miss Daisy because you don't have that southern accent, Miss Daisy. So you must be Morgan Freeman from Bruce Almighty, because you're wearing that white suit, so you're obviously God. There you go. Slow on the uptake, but you get there in the end. Hang on. If you're God, should I even be able to look upon you without melting or turning to stone or something? Don't believe everything you read. So what do you want from me anyway? Well, on very rare occasions, I enlist the use of helpers, if you feel up to it. Up to what? God, now slowly pacing about, hands behind his back like a general about to give out a mission to his troops, occasionally looking at the names of books on shelves, blowing dust off them, not feeling the need to look at Martin directly. Now, I need to know you can cope under pressure. If I give you this, would you be able to take the responsibility? I still don't know what you want to give me. God now looks at Martin square in the eyes. Well, you want John Lennon back, don't you? Oh, God. Yes? Hang on, so you heard what I said in the pub? I am omnipotent. Well, actually, even though I can listen to everyone at the same time, all the time, you'd be surprised how that novelty wears off. You realize... You've been listening to some old woman talk about chronic inflammation of the anus in a Pekingese dog for an over an hour, and you think to yourself, I'm God. Have I got nothing better to do than hear about a dog's ass? What the hell am I doing? Hang on, are you meant to say hell? I mean, I don't know anything about these things, but it just seems weird hearing you use it as a swear word. Like if you said bollocks. And hang on, wouldn't it be sacrilegious against yourself? I'll say whatever the hell I want. I am God, after all. And besides, hell's not so bad. Picture heaven and hell as the difference between a five-star hotel and a one-star hotel. I mean, you've still got as much incentive to be good and get into the five-star hotel as opposed to living a life of sin than spending an eternity in a one-star hotel where the toilet regularly gets blocked up with a, a rat, not always even a dead one, and there's no air conditioning. Where do you think the notion of hell being hot came from? So what's the devil like? What, Benny? Oh, he's a funny guy. Has us falling about laughing most of the time. That's why he's known as the Falling Angel. I thought he was the Fallen Angel. What? Where do you read this crap? I'm sure it said he'd done something wrong and so you cast him into the depths of hell. Now just hold on a minute here. How would a forgiving God not forgive? I mean, Benny and I have had the odd crosswords, but then when we make up, we're closer than ever. You have to forgive. Yeah, that does actually make more sense. Well, I'm glad to be of service. Now on to more pressing matters. Do you know what a controlled demolition is? You mean like when a huge building is carefully brought to the ground? That's right. Using dynamite and carefully arranged series of detonations, perfectly timed and in the correct order, you can bring down a skyscraper without harming anyone or causing a fuss. Well, that's how you're going to reintroduce, reinstate, 
and reintegrate John Lennon back into a world that he no longer knows or no longer really knows him. So what happens next? Oh, I'll have to think on this. I'm just riffing with you right now. Got to give this some serious thought. I'll get back to you on that. Till then, you go back to dreaming. Oh, okay. Suddenly, Martin is dreaming. He's going down some river rapids in a small rubber dinghy. He has a paddle already in his hand, but as he furiously tries to control the dinghy, he loses his paddle. Martin then notices he has a co-pilot sat in front, facing forward, a man with long, dark hair. As the water calms down for a brief moment, he sees a handwritten sign on the riverbank saying, Shit Creek. With that, the man in front looks back at him and says, I think this is going to get worse before it gets better. Martin's jaw drops as he realizes it's John Lennon. As the camera pulls back to reveal, they're only 20 feet from the edge of a huge waterfall. With that, Martin wakes up with a shriek, wipes his brow and lays there for a minute. As he gets up out of bed, he hears sounds coming from the bathroom. He walks in to find there's someone in his shower. Knowing he was the only one in the house, he rips open the shower cubicle door to find John Lennon busy rinsing himself under the shower head. He turns back at Martin and says, Good morning. Perfectly replicating the moment Bobby Ewing came back from the dead in Dallas. What the fuck? Martin says, not realising who this is and shocked that some random stranger is even in his house. He leaps for the door, runs downstairs to find something to defend himself with. Not really thinking straight, he looks straight past a huge bread knife and reaches for a tin of mini hot dogs in baked bean sauce. Now armed with his deadly bean tin, he runs back into the bathroom to find John now stood by the window, stark bollock naked, trying to look out of the smoky glass. Hey mate, can you arm me that towel? Uh, yeah, sure. Martin is torn between being shocked, confused and starstruck. The only thing keeping him from running out of the house or phoning the police is that this is most likely a dream. As Martin sheepishly hands John the towel, he averts his eyes. Even in a dream, Martin isn't comfortable gazing upon a naked, wet man. What's your name, mate? Martin. And I think I know who you are. Yeah. So who are you here with, then? How you mean? Well, at the party last night. There wasn't a party. So how did I get so wasted that I can't even remember how I got in this shower? I've no idea. Whose place is this, anyway? Hey, do you reckon they've got any gear left? Well, it's my place, and there's no gear to speak of. Shame. Must have been good shit. I don't even know where I am. <laughs> Must be wearing off now, though, because my back is killing me. Hey, got any painkillers? Yeah, in that cabinet. I got aspirin, if that's any good. Really? Nothing stronger than that. Christ, it's getting worse. What did I get up to last night? Feels like I've got a knife in me back. You sure it's not five bullets? Bloody feels like it. Hey, go see if anyone else has got any gear left. Well, it's only me here. So where's Yoko and everyone else gone? Well, they were never here. I don't even know how you got here, frankly. Then reality suddenly hits Martin like a brick in the face. This dream is a little too vivid. He really did speak with God last night, and there really is a dead member of the Beatles in his bathroom. So where the hell is Yoko then? I've got to get back to the flat quick and hope she hasn't noticed I haven't been home yet. She's going to throw a fit. I just hope I haven't done something I'm going to regret. I put aside my womanizing days with the guys when I met her. I'm not going to lose her now because of some stupid fling. Yeah, I don't think you've had a fling, but we do need to talk. Oh, yeah? Well, anything you've got to say, mate, I'd better be quick because I seriously need to get back. Hey, where the hell are me clothes? Hmm, that's the problem. I really don't know where to begin. <sighs> well, you can start by telling me where the frig me clothes are. The sheer weight of the situation is now all too much for Martin, and he starts to feel dizzy. And his throat starts to lightly pulsate in that way you feel as your body's preparing to throw up. I don't feel well. I think I'm going to puke. As he rushes over to the sink, he starts heaving. <laughs> Jesus, mate! Hey, you probably had a bad pill. You haven't got any left, have you? 
Martin vomits up his insides in the sink, while a now dry but still naked John Lennon watches on. Hey, you all right, Martin? Yes, thanks. John. Martin's accepted the fact that this most definitely is John Lennon and not a dream. Your nose doesn't burn from stomach acid tasting vomit in a dream. So any chance of helping me find me clothes, mate? Your clothes aren't here. But put on this dressing gown and we'll see if I've got something that fits you in my wardrobe. Martin leaves John putting on the gown and heads for the bedroom. John is checking himself out in the mirror as Martin calls out, Are you all right with tracky bottoms and a hoodie? What the fuck? Martin, realising John wouldn't have heard of the name hoodie before, says, Oh, of course you don't know what a hoodie is, do you? I'm back in fucking England! Martin spins round to find John, now in the bedroom, looking out the window onto a street that couldn't look any less like New York, where he'd been living for the last eight years before his death. If this is an acid flashback, I've never seen one so real. Yeah, I think we might need to have that talk now. Five minutes later, John comes down the stairs now wearing a tracksuit as Martin hands him a cup of tea. I'm out of milk, so I put three sugars in to compensate. Don't worry, I need it strong. So, where do I start? One hour later, after quite frankly the most ludicrous argument between an unemployed eBayer and one of the most famous rock stars in the world, now back from the dead, John is watching a news report on the BBC News website about Mark Chapman and his release from prison. I feel numb, John says quietly, the wind totally knocked out of his sails, his eyes now glazed and red. If he only blinked, the tears would drop, but he doesn't. Well, I just hate being the one to have to tell you. Yeah, you must be having a terrible time, mate. Sorry about that. Hey, don't shoot the messenger. You really think that's an appropriate thing to say to a man who's been shot five times and is dead? Do you know what? I don't actually know the usual protocol of how one speaks to a dead member of the Beatles. A hey, ex-member of the Beatles. I left that nine years ago. Yeah, it might be a bit longer than that now. So who do I report this to? How do you mean? I don't know, the police or something. Um, if you mean report to the police that you've been shot, I think they already know. Well, what the fuck am I meant to do right now? Uh, we need to sit down and work out a plan of action, I think. I hope you've got some ideas, because my mind's a mess. Me heart's beating a mile a minute and I can't breathe. Well, you're probably hyperventilating because you're in shock. Hey, breathe into this bag, sit on the sofa, and I'll get you a can of lager and a DVD to help you relax first. Always helps me wind down. As for the plan, we can work it out later. Hey, yeah, these DVDs, what are they, uppers or downers? Actually, I don't give a shit. Seriously, anything you got, I'll have it all. What? I already said I have no drugs. A DVD isn't some new super strain of LSD. It's a film, a movie. Why the bloody hell would I want to see a film right now? It was meant to be a bit of a distraction to calm you down and was all I could think of, quite frankly. I'm sorry if I'm not trained in stress relief or counselling. I always like to put on a DVD to fall asleep to and this particular one I just thought might be appropriate. Well, it'd better be a good one, because I seriously need something to calm me down if you've got no drugs. You'll love it. It's my favourite film, With Nail and Eye, it's called, and I think you'll appreciate the subject matter. Well, I hope nobody gets shot in it. Oh, God, no! It's set in 1969, and it's about two guys trying to wean themselves off drugs by going on holiday in the country. Christ, it sounds bloody awful! Yeah, I've got to admit, I've never really managed to convince my girlfriends to watch it over the years with that description. Trust me, it's a cult classic, and it was made by a company owned by your mate, George Harrison. Ah, oh, now that sounds a bit more like it. George has very good taste. How is the old bastard? Dead. Oh, for fuck's sake! It's now two hours later, and we see the closing credits of With Nail and I silhouetted by the back of John and Martin's heads above the back of the sofa. The more John reminisces, the more he wants to see his wife and sons. Listen, before we go public with this, I gotta see Yoko and me boys. Well, we gotta work out how we're gonna go about this. This could take a while. If you don't want to be considered a crackpot, for now, the best I can do is show you what they look like now. What? You've got a picture? Well, I don't personally, but the internet will have hundreds. Two minutes later, 
Oh my God, my sons are so big and they look just like me. Julian is now 50. Jesus, that's 10 years older than I am. Yeah, that is weird. And look at Sean with a beard like his dad. They've lived a whole life that I don't know about. Well, if you want to find out more about their lives, we can look on their Wikipedia pages. See here, Julian Lennon? Martin scrolls slowly down the screen. He then says, Now we can see Sean's. No, hold on a sec, I'm reading that. It says, After John Lennon died, his son Julian had to buy mementos of his dad at auction like everyone else. Oh, Jesus, what have I done? Eh? Why, didn't you leave him any in your will? Well, a will isn't something I really put a lot of thought into. You don't expect to be dying till you're old and grey, so I guess I kept it simple and was always going to come back to it, you know, at a later date, like a work in progress. What, so your first son got nothing of yours and it all went to Sean and Yoko? No, Christ, I'm not a monster. I did set up a trust which, you know, would be shared out equally between me two sons. But that's just money, John. And it sounds like he ended up spending half of it on buying stuff you should have given him yourself, not the highest bidder. Oh, my God, it says here the most important stuff to him was the postcards you sent him when you were on tour because it at least showed him you were thinking about him. And yet he had to bid at auction against rabid Beatles collectors to buy them back. Oh, my God. It says here... I've never really wanted to know the truth about how Dad was with me. There was some very negative stuff talked about me, like when he said I'd come out of a whiskey bottle on a Saturday night, stuff like that. You think, where's the love in that? Paul and I used to hang out quite a bit, more than Dad and I ever did. We had a great friendship, and there seems to be far more pictures of me and Paul playing together at that age than there ever was pictures of me and me Dad. Is that true? My son hates me. Well, I shouldn't think he hates you, and I'm sure he's calmed down now. Yeah, but you heard him. Paul was a better dad to him than I ever was. You know, hey, Jude, that's about him. It was originally called Hey, Jules. There, you see, you can't be that bad a dad. You wrote him one of the best songs ever written. I didn't. It was Paul. He wrote it for my son to make him feel better when I left Julian's mother. Bloody hell, mate. I honestly don't know what to say. That I'm an arsehole? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if it makes you feel any better, he followed in your footsteps. He became a singer-songwriter. Look, here's the video of one of my favourites called Salt Water. Martin puts on YouTube and the video starts playing. John is utterly captivated, not saying a word. Then after about a minute, he says, Oh my God, it even sounds like one of my songs. So I guess something must have rubbed off then. And maybe he doesn't hate you quite as much as you think. This song is beautiful. John starts to cry. Martin doesn't really know how to cope with a crying beetle in his lounge. So he goes over to his record collection to find something. I've always loved this song and I think everyone felt it had you in its heart. From the way it was written, played, sung and even the sentiment. I actually bought it on CD single when it came out in the early 90s. Why was it CD? No, not that type of CD. Look, here you go. This is a CD single. Wow, it's like a mirror women carry around in their handbag. So his song is on this mirror. How do you play it? Like on a bigger mirror? What? That doesn't even make sense. Did you play 7-inch vinyl records on a bigger bit of vinyl? Uh, no. Come to think of it, it's just like it's something from the future. You know, like 2001 Space Odyssey. Yeah, which in itself is something from the past, considering this is 2015. This is making me head spin. This is making me feel old. You can't even buy CD singles anymore. It's all MP3s downloaded off the internet now. You don't get to own something you can hold anymore. There's no artwork or gatefold sleeves. Hang on. So fans don't have records or even these CD things to get rock stars to sign their autographs on anymore? No. But actually, that's a very good idea. We should buy some old Beatles merchandise and get you to sign it, and we can sell it on for 20 times more. After all, we're going to have to buy some flights. Flights? Yoko and Sean are in New York. Julian is in Italy, and we're in Liverpool and have no money. 
Christ alive, it's more like I'm back in time now. Listen, our only hope is I got a guy meant to be PayPaling me 800 quid tomorrow. Well, provided he doesn't let me down. Hang on, are you a rent boy? Oh my God, no! Oh, of course you don't know what PayPal means, do you? Well, I know what it sounds like, mate. Yeah, it does sound a bit dodgy, come to think of it. Anyway, PayPal is merely a way of people paying you, like a bank transfer or cheque. We might be able to get two flights just about with £800. Oh no, don't worry about us flying first class. I just want to get home. Uh, £800 is for two economy flights. Two first class tickets would be over £10,000. The money grabbing bastards! Well, it's not like it's ever really been a problem for me, the cost of first class flights. Still, it's nice to see British Airways are still in business. At least some things haven't changed. Is Laker Airways still about? No, they were gone about two years after you. Ah, fuck them. <laughs> nice. So how do I find where Yoko lives and what her phone number is now? I guess we Google it. Now that just sounds like baby talk. No, no, you can find out nearly everything on the internet. Just type it into this Google search and et voila. Christ, how the hell am I meant to make sense of all this gibberish? Where's a phone number on here? No, no, those are merely the search results for Yoko Ono Contact. It's come back with, Jesus, 4,330,000 of them. So you tell me, how am I going to get hold of my wife and tell her I'm okay? You do know this isn't a mere case of just calling home and saying, Hi, honey, I'm home. This will take some doing. It becomes apparent to both of them that this is going to take quite some planning. How do you discreetly contact the famous, now 82-year-old and well-guarded Yoko Ono to say you're John Lennon, still aged 40, and back from the dead, and be taken seriously? Sometime later, John's watching TV and sees an advert for The Walking Dead. He says, So if we go public with this, people are either going to call me crazy, a fraud, or a friggin' zombie. Martin sees that John is starting to feel really low, and so proposes a little trip out, around Liverpool, to start making him feel himself again. John points out he hasn't been here for eight years. Martin points out it's actually 43 years. They both realise a disguise has to be made. Shame it's not a good disguise. Martin wants to start him off on somewhere he won't have been before. John Lennon Airport. John is dumbfounded when he sees the airport and smiles when he reads their tagline, Above Us Only Sky, a lyric from his song Imagine. He says, I thought you only get an airport named after you if you're a president, like John F. Kennedy Airport. Maybe you just have to be shot. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, hang on, there was a John Wayne Airport, though, and he wasn't shot. Actually, I think he was shot in about half the movies he made. Yeah, but he died of cancer. Well, maybe you just have to be called John to get your own airport. Yeah, that'll be it. Well, that and be dead. Here's a cheery thought, eh? Oh, bloody, oh, bloody, life goes on. Whoa, oh, la, 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 life goes on. Yeah, well, your life won't be going on much longer if you keep singing that pile of shit. Hey, would we be able to fly to New York out of my own airport? Yes, possibly. Good, at least they'll know who I am, because I haven't got me passport. Oh, God. Bollocks! Martin then drives them to Penny Lane and many other landmark locations in John's life, ending with a walk through Strawberry Fields. John goes quiet for a while. Reality is really hitting home now, but he doesn't really have a home now. With tears starting to well up and a quivering voice, he quietly says, Listen, Martin, this is all very well and good, but I really want to get back to my old life, you know. I thought I'd escaped Liverpool years ago, and this just feels like I've been kidnapped and dropped back in time. Funny thing is, I've actually gone 35 years into the future, and it's still not me home. You know, I still can't get a handle on all this. I'm struggling here, mate. So how do we go about breaking this story out there so I can get my life back? That's the problem, John. I don't know. Well, back in the day, we used to hold a press conference... He says with an ironic, sad and gentle laugh. Yeah, but you can't do that now. If you contact the press with what is basically the story of the millennium, 
that your John Lennon, back from the dead, 35 years later, yet unaged, here to walk the earth again by royal appointment of God himself, they wouldn't even send round a photographer from the local paper. When you put it like that, it does make me sound nuts, doesn't it? I'm afraid it doesn't help that the only person who knows you for real is an unemployed guy who buys and sells tat on eBay. Yeah, well, it's not your fault, mate, that I'm in this mess. Yeah, actually it is. God only brought you back to life because last night in the pub, I said that he always took the best ones young, and if he wanted to do something cool, he'd hand back John Lennon. To be honest, it was one of those things you just say in a pub. But you'll keep your mouth shut in future, eh? Yeah, totally. So I have you to thank for getting me a second chance at life then. Yeah, you can thank me later after you're rich again. I just hope there's still a life waiting for me, you know. When I get back, if there's even anything to get back to. Don't worry, we'll get you back and it'll all turn out fine. Do you seriously believe that? Nah, not really. It just seemed like if this was a film, that's what I'd be expected to say. Well, thank you for your honesty. Now, how are we going to break it to the world that a man has come back from the dead? Ah, but you're not just any man, are you? You're one of the Beatles, the coolest one. Well, at least the deadest one. Seriously, this could work. The world has gone insane. Celebrity is everything now. I see a plan forming. To the Batcave. As they start driving, John asks, So you think I'm the coolest one then? Yeah, you were always the wittiest one and the edgiest one. Well, I accept your comments and your checks in the post. See, there's that wit. So you want me to do something edgy now? Nah, I think being the walking dead is edgy enough. You cheeky bastard. Hey, do people still say cool? Yeah, well, what about fab? Only a twat would say fab nowadays. Oh, yeah. What the hell is eBay? Martin then shows John how to use YouTube and Twitter. They then set upon the first leg of Martin's action plan to set up a Facebook account for John Lennon. Hang on a minute. You already have a Facebook account. Well, that's news to me. Hey, look at all the lovely stuff people are saying about me. Actually, I don't know why I'm surprised thinking about it. All famous people have a Facebook account, and I guess their accounts just stay active after they die, so fans can pay tribute and such. I just wasn't expecting you to have one. You died so many years before even the internet, let alone Facebook. Yeah, thanks for reminding me, mate. Well, I suppose an uphill struggle was on the cards from the offset. Still, that is an account for the dead, John Lennon. So we'll just start from the beginning and create a Facebook account for the now alive John Lennon. There you go. It's official. You're now a real person again. That's comforting. Yeah, it's like Pinocchio, isn't it? You are a real boy. Yeah, well, let's hope my nose doesn't grow like his. It's not that subtle at the best of times. Yeah, good point, actually. You're pretty recognisable, even dressed as a chav. We need to find you a disguise if you're going to be able to walk around the streets. Well, certainly until we've gone fully public. Well, I've no idea what a chav is, but I've never liked the attention that much before. How the hell are people going to treat me now I'm dead? You're not dead anymore. You've got to stop thinking that way. You have been brought back to life by God himself. That must feel pretty good. Yeah, maybe it's an acquired taste. So how come you speak directly to God and he's bringing dead celebrities back to life for you? Are you a happy, clappy God, Bob, then? That's the thing. No, I'm not even a believer. Well, I wasn't until last night. I think you're the first one as well, well, that he's brought back to life. Yeah, I think Jesus might have something to say about that. What, that he's bigger than the Beatles? Nice. Actually, I don't even know that much about Jesus, God and the Bible. And for that matter, I don't even know that much about the Beatles and, well, John Lennon. I just know what songs I like. Ah, well, nice to know you're not some crazy screaming fan. Can't be dealing with that. Certainly not right now. So what songs of mine do you like? Well, my absolute favourite is Yesterday. That's Paul's. And it was originally called Scrambled Eggs. Well, Hey Jude, that's Paul's as well. We can work it out. Paul's again. Although I did ride the bridge because all he could think of was shite. Carry on. Let it be. Yeah, we're still on Paul's little ditties there, aren't we? And I can't stand that one. Keep going. You'll get there in the end. Penny Lane. 
Paul's. You know, you could have just said strawberry fields, which was on the other side, but you didn't, did you? Love me, do. Keep going. Can't buy me love. Oh, God. Sergeant Peppers. Jesus. Here comes the sun. That's George's. Christ, he hardly wrote any of our songs, and you've picked one of his. Octopus's Garden. Fuck here now. Did you just name a song written by Ringo the Bloody Drummer? All right, then. Imagine. I know that one is yours. Yeah. But that doesn't count because I'd left the Beatles by then. So you've got no other band members to prefer over me. Well, I'm sorry. You're putting me on the spot here. If you gave me time, I'd be able to remember all your songs I like. What? Songs like Help? Love it. All you need is love. Love it. Hard Day's Night? Love it. Ticket to Ride? Love it. Don't Let Me Down? Love it. Come Together? Love it. Day Tripper? Like it. Hey, what's that all about? You picked Octopus's Garden as a favourite, and yet Day Tripper you only like. Okay, I love it then. Oh, no, no. It's too late now. You just lost credibility, my friend. Well, sorry if I'm not a Beatles historian and can just reel off all your complete back catalogue in one go. Right. Well, you barely made it through. And that's only because you didn't say you liked When I'm 64, because I'd happily have decked you. Give peace a chance, Martin smiles sarcastically, and John fake punches him in the shoulder. Sometime later, Martin is showing John around the house, which only takes about 35 seconds due to its size. Martin says... I don't have a lot of space here, but my box room has a camp bed in it, which should be comfortable enough until we can think of something else. Shame it doesn't have a window, but then maybe we don't want anyone being able to peer in at Jesus Beetle. We do, after all, need to keep this very much under wraps, for the time being at least. Jesus Beetle? Yeah, because Jesus came back from the dead and God would have had something to do with that as well. I was trying to think of a catchy title for you whilst being funny at the same time. Sometimes I try to be funny, it doesn't always work. No kidding. So let me get this clear. He's now Sir Paul McCartney. He's still bringing out albums 35 years after I died. He still tours. He's in the Guinness Book of Records as the world's most successful songwriter. He's close to being a billionaire. And yet I'm back in Liverpool sleeping on someone's floor without a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out. Are you sure this isn't hell? No, apparently hell is more like a one-star hotel. So marginally better than this, then. Hmm, yeah, good point. I must admit, I do regularly apologise for providing guests with worse-than-hell amenities. But to correct you, you won't be sleeping on the floor. There is a frame to that camp bed somewhere, if I can find it. Still, at least I don't have a rat in my toilet. Well, I shall be thankful for small mercies, then. Martin puts on YouTube to show John the video of Paul McCartney singing Hey Jude at the 2012 Olympics. Christ alive, Paul looks old. Still got it, though, the jammy bastard. Oh, missed a couple of notes there, John. I suppose every part of your body ends up either wrinkly, loose as a goose or sagging. Imagine his balls. Must be down to his knees by now. God, I love that silly sod. Now, hang on, this gives me an idea. We could film you singing a song and upload it onto YouTube and see if we can make it go viral. Sounds great, if I only knew what upload and viral meant. That night, Martin introduces John to the Xbox and, more importantly, Rock Band, the Beatles edition of the game. John laughs out loud for the first time as he wins. This first episode ends at the end of the first day as John falls asleep. Still sat upright on the sofa... Xbox guitar controller still in his arms, exhausted from his first day in a brand new world. As Martin falls asleep, he is visited once again by God. So, how did it go? I thought you were omnipotent. Oh, sarcasm in the face of God. There's a new sin. Let me write that one down. I guess I'd better be careful then. Don't really want to end up in hell, clearing endless rats out of a toilet... Yeah, I've told Benny countless times about that. He should go with more variety, you know, block toilets with other furry animals. But he just says you don't mess with the classics. That's Benny. Yeah, he sounds a scream. Oh, you'll get to meet him. Hang on, so I am going to hell. 
Oh, no. You do this right. I've got much bigger plans for you. Sounds ominous. You'll love it. Incidentally, did you bring John Lennon back from the dead in my shower purely so you could reenact the shower scene from Dallas? You know, when Bobby Ewing comes back from the dead? I mean, wasn't there a less traumatic way? Like I said, you don't mess with the classics. I can't argue with that, especially as I'm absolutely shattered after today. Well, I guess I'll bid you good night then. Yeah, no night. God bless. Wow, you made it all the way to the end. Thank you so much. Unless you forwarded and then that's just naughty. But if you did really listen to the entire thing, thank you so much. As a special present, because you are, let's face it, a delight. Here are two videos that should be on the screen. Um, I don't know which way round they'll be. Maybe the one on the left is the one that's the TV programme called Ill-Gotten Gains. It was on BBC One and BBC Two. It got repeated quite a lot of times and made me quite popular in prison because there's not many TV programs about criminals that they get to watch whilst in prison. Especially the fact that I wasn't in for murder and ugh, horrible things. You know, it was plants. Naughty plants, yes. Although they're not even naughty in plenty of countries like Canada and plenty of states in America and obviously Amsterdam and plenty of other places, you know. Let's be practical here. I didn't invent these plants, and a lot of people use these for medical reasons, and a lot of naughty people use it for much more fun things. Either way, this program was not only about the quote-unquote crime that had happened, growing some plants. A lot of plants, I'll grant you, but they're still plants. No one complains about cabbages. Anyway, and... And, well, I do like cabbages. Sprouts, I friggin' hate. You can keep sprouts. Make them illegal, yeah? Please. So bitter. <laughs> but like the Murphys, I'm not bitter. But, um, yeah, yeah, so basically it was about the sale of all my incredible stuff at this police auction. You know, these incredible cars and film props and arcade machines and toys and... Oh, God, I miss having all those things. But, you know, fiddle-dee-dee... Either way, it was interesting. There was one side of me that was like, oh my God, look, there's my bat bike. There's my bat boat. There's my ice cream van, the vintage ice cream van. There's my whatever, my Iron Man statue and whatever, right? And on the other hand, it was like, oh my God, they just sold all that stuff so cheap. Oh God. Either way, I did keep myself very positive throughout my entire prison sentence. And, um, yeah, you know, I stayed productive and stuff. But, yes, I did come out to being homeless for a week. Mind you, let's face it, I'm very much a glasses half full kind of guy. I At least I'm OK with being homeless for a week. I'd rather be that than homeless, you know, for years. You don't have to feel too sorry for me, is my point. But um, the other video that will be on the screen, it's about the fact that the police basically tried to do me for as much as they possibly could. Yeah, they tried to do me for slavery at one point until they realised these so-called Vietnamese slaves had, uh, was it six iPhones between four of them? Interesting. Several thousand pounds, and they were wearing, like, really expensive watches and trainers and, you know, they had Rolexes and whatever. Um... And, yeah, it was kind of obvious they were being paid a lot of money, yeah? I'm, I can tell you, they were being paid £11,000 each month, each! Originally, it was 10000 but after a year, in a kind of profit-sharing thing, which slaves don't tend to get, uh, their money went up, like, higher than inflation went up. So, yeah, that was good. Either way, um, if you like the story that you just heard, let me know. I'd love to hear from you, you know, give me some thumbs up, you know, like, share, subscribe, all the stuff that everyone else says and I wouldn't even normally think of saying, but I need to think about these things now. Either way, again, enough of my yakking. Thank you so much. Enjoy these other videos. I don't know what's to enjoy. Actually, there's plenty to enjoy about them. Again, glasses half full. Either way, let me know if you want to hear episode two of, by the way, it's called Imagine. That's an original name, isn't it? John Lennon, Imagine. Anyway, thanks ever so much. Bye.